Hi, I'm Madeline Finko. I'm a professor at uh, Weill Cornell Medical College. And I'm going to be giving this CME course entitled Understanding the Nuances of Study Design. There's been a lot of talk about shale gas development and the need for research. In other words, how do we know whether the process is actually leading to disease or not? And it's research that's going to help us better understand what the risk factors are, what the strength of association is between the risk factor and the disease, what's the disease burden in the population. And we can't do this, we're only guessing, if we don't have the data. So we need to look at what other factors might be causing disease in populations. We want to know who's most at risk for the disease. What are their characteristics? And how do they differ from those who don't have the disease? There are lots of different types of studies that one could choose from. Each have their own strengths, each have their own weaknesses. And what this session is going to do is to a certain extent go over the options. What, do we, what can we choose from? And we want to look at the difficulty in assessing causality and association. It's very, very difficult to do that. And we want to acquire an understanding of the different study designs. Which study would be the best to, to do to get us the information that we want. And then, of course, which statistical test should we use in each study to make sure that we're looking at the most appropriate way uh, to analyze the data. Um, many people think it's very nice to throw in a whole bunch of statistics in their papers, but we don't want a statistical shopping list. We want the right statistic, the right study, um, in order to get the best answer. There's a many different def definitions of research, but basically what we're focusing on is to collect, to analyze, and interpret information to answer questions. And that's key, to answer questions. We're posing questions, and we hope to get information that's going to answer them. And this is a strict methodology. And basically, it's a systematic way of observing, of classifying, and interpreting data. And one needs to follow the plan rather than just do some sort of a, a half-hearted attempt at, at collecting data and then drawing conclusions, usually not correct ones because the data are uh, obtained from faulty studies. So we want to make sure that the studies designed well, executed well, and that the findings are meaningful. There's a method, there's a procedure, there are techniques, and we're looking at validity and reliability of the study design and the study findings. The study has to be unbiased and it should be objective. What you don't want to do is to get answers to the questions, but to a certain extent they're not correct answers because of bias that's inherent in the study. Bias is error. Other factors are not errors, but still may distort the findings. Research is empirical, so we're drawing conclusions based on hard evidence, data that are collected in an organized, systematic way from individuals, from records, from many different sources, but there has to be a systematic, uh, objective way of obtaining that information and then analyzing the data. So let's turn now to causality and association. And what we're trying to do here is to determine to what extent a particular exposure is associated with an outcome. And then to determine to what extent such an association is causal. Very difficult to, to, to find true causality where A causes B. The best, I suppose, is to focus on infectious diseases where you know if you're bitten by an infected uh, fly, a mosquito, what have you, a disease is going to develop. Without that bite, you're not going to develop the disease. When we're looking at chronic diseases, it's much more difficult because there may be many factors that are potential causes for the development of the disease. So what we look for is the strength of association. How strong is the association between the risk factor and the disease? And an association is said to exist if the exposure increases or decreases the risk of disease in one or more groups. In all of epidemiology, we're looking at population groups. 
we're not focusing on the individual per se. We're pooling information together to obtain information on the population under study. A positive association of, uh, implies that exposure tends to increase the risk. So again, focusing on shale gas development, there are many who feel that uh, before the development of, of uh, this uh, methodology of abstracting the uh, gas from shale, you know, they were perfectly fine. Once the, uh, uh, the well was drilled, people started to get sick. Maybe coincidental, maybe not, but we want to see to what extent uh, are people experiencing this, this uh, exposure. So if it's positive, we say that the exposure tends to increase the risk. If it's negative, the exposure tends to decrease the risk. And I guess the best example for that is looking at the studies of colon cancer and diet, where people who ate a lot of broccoli and cauliflower tended not to get colon cancer in comparison to those who did not eat a lot of broccoli and cauliflower. In causation and association, we have a couple of different uh, terms. We talk about sufficient cause, and this is a factor or combination of factors that will produce disease. That the risk factor is sufficient to cause disease. A component cause is a factor that contributes towards disease causation, but it's not necessarily sufficient to cause the disease on its own. And a necessary cause is any agent that is required for the development of the disease. You have to have that exposure in order to get the disease. So again, we're not going to dwell on, on these uh, types of association, but we need to be mindful that many different factors may indeed cause a disease, contribute to disease development, um, and very, very few are absolute. Um, that with it, you will always get the disease, and without it, you never will. That's mostly in infectious disease uh, epidemiology, not so in chronic disease. So what we want to know and what we want to consider are the following. Do the results reveal an association between exposure, risk factor, agent, and disease? Okay. What kind of an association? Is it a weak one? Is it sort of in between or is it strong? We need to assess the strength of the association. And what other factors, what sources of error, which are bias, could have contributed to the results? What didn't we take into account in doing the study and that these factors, this error or these errors, are really the factors that are contributing to the disease? And if the agent is associated with the disease, to what extent is that relationship causal? Again, going back to the same question I've been asking, what is the strength of the association? So risk factors may or may not be causal. And as I said, there's rarely a one-to-one -one relationship between a risk factor and a disease. And just because a risk factor may predict disease, it's not necessarily the cause, okay, of that disease. disease. This is all getting a little confusing, but I think we need to keep this in the back of our minds as we go forward in uh, parsing the study designs. One can statistically combine risk factors to, pr to produce a risk prediction model, and many people do that in their own research. But we really need to better understand the pathway, the causal pathway, and understand <coughs> that rarely there is a one-to-one -one relationship. That is really very rare. What we're trying to do is weigh the evidence. We want to look at cause and effect, and that's sometimes a judgment call. And what we're doing is, uh, in a sense, building a web of causation. Looking at all the factors, looking at the strength of the association of those factors to the disease, and then trying to determine which ones most often will lead to disease, which are less often, and which probably don't lead to disease at all. So we have to sort of sift and weigh the evidence in order to come to some sort of intelligent conclusion. Uh, a lot of this um, 
uh, can be, um, an analogy I suppose can be made with the smoking uh, studies that were done in the early 50s and 60s. They had hypotheses, they had uh, questions about the effect of tobacco smoking on lung cancer, but they needed the evidence to, to actually determine that it was smoking tobacco that led to lung cancer. Not in everybody, but more often than not, those who smoked, and those who smoked a lot, and those who spoke, smoked um, for a long period of time, were the ones who were at greater risk of developing lung cancer. And in a certain extent, that's what we need to do as we try and design studies to investigate the causal pathways of disease uh, and shale gas development. We use something called Hill's criteria. Sir A. Bradford Hill was a British epidemiologist, statistician, and he uh, very eloquently uh, set up this, this uh, criteria. And if you look at it, it's really so self-evident. You figured, well, why did we have to even put it on paper? But he did. And the criteria for assessing this, uh, the uh, uh, relationship between a risk factor and a disease has to be met by a series of, of factors. How strong is that association? And I'm going to get into some statistics that uh, I'll talk about later that will give you an indication about how strong the association is between the risk factor and the disease. If it's weak, then you really can't go forward and say that X causes Y. We want to look at a dose-response uh, relationship. In other words, um, as one, going back to smoking, for example, uh, the more cigarettes you smoked, the greater your risk of disease. So when we're looking at shale gas development, one could hypothesize and say that the closer one lives to a, a, a drilling rig, the greater the risk. You know, what's the proximity? Those who live in, in cities or further away are probably less at risk because they're not close enough uh, uh, to it. Uh, that's, you know, and, and you're getting a greater dose, if you will, of the risk factor by proximity. Replication of findings is extraordinarily important. One study is not going to be enough to convince anybody that we have something uh, showing uh, uh, elevated risk. We want to see what other, other studies have shown. What's the replication of findings? Are other studies finding similar um, results? And that will lend strength, greater credence to the fact that maybe we really do have something that we should look at. It has to be biologically plausible, so you have to understand a little bit about the chemistry and the biology of the process, and then disease development. Uh, temporal relationship in certain diseases is very important. Um, cessation of exposure. If you get rid of the uh, hypothesized risk factor, if you drain the swamp and get rid of the mosquitoes, you probably won't see malaria. So if you stop drilling, one should theoretically see a decrease in the uh, number of complaints people have about uh, um, health effects from the drilling. What other alternate explanations are there? We're looking a lot of, at a lot of diseases. We're looking at a lot of factors. Could there be other factors that may lead to certain diseases that we're not thinking about and have nothing to do with the drilling process at all? And again, building on what we said about replication of findings, the consistency with other knowledge. Does this all make sense? That's the key thing. Does this make sense? So what we want to do is we want to consider what factors are important in assessing the study. Now we're moving forward. We've laid the foundation. We're trying to look for cause and effect, elevated risk, and disease development. But what kind of study should one do? What kind of study should one read in order to get the best uh, uh, picture of what's going on? And there are many different factors that have to be taken into account because not every study is perfect, most aren't. So what would weaken a study? What would help change your mind that the findings from the study, no matter how elegantly it's done, uh, are, are not perhaps as trustworthy as others that might be from a stronger study. So we want to take a look at the study population. Who's included in the study? What are their characteristics? 
how do they differ from the general population or from the population with the diseases that one is looking at? Extraordinarily important to understand who's in the study. Study design is important too. Some studies you can test hypotheses, some studies you can't. So which study design is going to be uh, you know, used? And again, uh, looking at the strengths and weaknesses of each, is this the good study, the best type of study design to do? Clearly we need to look at the number of subjects or participants in the study. And this all deals with statistical power that you probably remember from EPI 101 that you took goodness knows how many years ago. But if you have too few people in the study, one could say that the study was underpowered and therefore perhaps not as uh, strong as other studies that would have perhaps more people with statistical power. You want to look at the statistical findings and look for statistical significance. And most importantly, you want to look at the duration of the study. A lot of these diseases, particularly chronic diseases, take time to develop. So if you're looking over a very short period of time, there's a good bet that you're probably not going to see any disease develop because your, 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 your study um, duration is much too short. We need to look at bias as a source of error. Going back to study population, is there selection bias? Are we picking the wrong people to be in the study? Is there recall bias? People who are sick tend to recall better, uh, in quotes, than those who aren't sick. And we need to take into the consideration of confounding, and I'm going to describe that in a couple of different slides later on. So all of these factors should be in your mind as you're reading any study, not just ones you know, related to, to shale gas development, but any study. When you're looking at uh, elevated risk in disease, all of these factors have to be uh, in your mind and you have to decide whether the study is appropriate uh, in order to continue reading and, and to uh, accept, if you will, the findings of the study. So there are different types of study designs. There's quantitative, which is mostly the studies that you read in the journals, and qualitative, mostly used in psychology, psychiatry, and so forth. So let's focus on the differences. In qualitative studies, you're looking um, to gather an in-depth analysis of human behavior and the reasons that govern such behavior. You're looking at, uh, you're collecting data, you have high you know, usually in these cases, hypotheses, and you're testing them. And you try and understand the way people interpret and make sense of their experiences in the world in which they live in. Basically, these are the most of the types of studies that are done. And we look on samples of uh, populations as opposed to huge groups. Huge groups tend to be uh, studied in descriptive studies. With quantitative studies, we also look at the empirical collection of data, all right? We're testing hypotheses and the process of measurement is central to this type of research. So quantitative research is collecting data, analyzing it, presenting the findings. There's a hierarchy also in research. At the top of the pyramid are something called systematic reviews. And these are a collection of studies, usually, system, usually randomized trials, that have been done, they've been pooled and analyzed, and it gives you an excellent um, uh, uh, indication as to what's going on. I mean, obviously, the studies that are included in a systematic review have to be similar. You don't want to compare apples and oranges. But here, somebody else has done the work for you. Rather than you're going through many different randomized trials, Someone has done that for you. So when you're searching the literature um, to investigate or answer a question, you should always look first to see if a systematic review has been published on the uh, topic. If not, then you would drop down to try and find randomized clinical trials, which are the gold standards. Here we eliminate bias by randomizing people to one group or another. One group gets the experimental drug, the other group gets the placebo, etc. So they're the types of studies that you'd want to look at, absent a systematic review. 
And in between systematic review and randomized controlled trials are meta-analyses. They too are pooling together data from different sources um, and, and analyzing the data. Cohort studies are important. They're prospective. They follow a group over time. These people are healthy or presumed to be healthy at the onset. Case control studies are retrospective. We already know who's sick. We already know who has the disease. And we are comparing them to a control group. Case series, case reports, you would never make a clinical decision based on these. But they may lead to the design of more empirical studies, hypothesis generating studies, um, because they have identified something unusual among a small group of people. And then there are editorials and experts' opinion. That's very nice, but certainly uh, you wouldn't change your treatment practice based on an editorial, I shouldn't think. So we have two types of hypothesis generating studies. We have descriptive studies and ecological studies, quite similar. And then we have hypothesis testing uh, types of studies. And these are the uh, observational or analytical studies, the cohort, the case control, and the clinical trials. So let's go first now to descriptive studies. And these are important, even though they're not testing a hypothesis, they're important because they're raising issues, they're raising questions, they're an indication of the burden of disease in a population. So we'll start first with the descriptive studies. Here we're looking at characteristics in a population, in a large group, over time. And the key factors are person, place, and time. Who are the people that we're looking at? Where? And over what time period? Usually it's usually a year. Trend data are important. So if we're looking at uh, trends in diabetes, for example, or trends in asthma, that information is based on descriptive studies. We're not able to determine uh, causal factors or anything else about who gets sick, who doesn't. All we can say is we can tell the number of people with the disease, the prevalence, or the number of new cases, the incidence of the disease. Okay, so descriptive studies, uh, well, actually we don't really focus on incidents. Uh, we, over time we could see how many new cases develop, but we're focusing on, on prevalent studies. And these will give you an indication of the burden of disease at a specific point in time. Okay, so everything is time sensitive and place sensitive. So we may want to look at diabetes in the United States in 2012. And then we may want to compare that to previous years, uh, 2011. So the data are uh, obtained from um, usually um, government sources, large data banks, and they can be then abstracted and analyzed. These are good first steps looking for the determinants of disease or for risk factors. They help raise questions, but they don't test hypotheses. And there are strengths and weaknesses to this. I mean, they're quick and cheap comparatively. Um, they're very good to look at prevalence, and they can generate hypotheses for further analytic testing. You also can look at multiple outcomes. You know, you're looking at diabetes, you're looking at uh, other factors, but they rely on data that are collected, um, usually, as I said, by the government, state, federal, city, and, and they're nice as background information. So if you're looking at any study that's published, basically they may give a, you know, some background statistics on the uh, prevalence in, uh, you know, and, uh, of the disease in the population. You cannot, though, look at cause and effect or a sequence of events. You have no idea when the person got sick. Was it in January? Was it in July? Was it in November? You just know in one year, X number of people had the disease. So you can't differentiate between cause and effect or sequence of events. Another type of study is something called ecological studies, where exposure to a risk factor is characterized by the average average exposure of the group to which the individual belongs. Okay, it sort of gets a little complicated here. Um, 
And then it gets further complicated in the second bullet because individuals in a generally exposed group may not have been the ones actually exposed to the risk factor, and this is something called ecologically, ecological fallacy. Um, these are population-based studies. They give you an indication, a snapshot, just as the descriptive studies do, a snapshot of disease burden in a population at a specific place over a specific period of time. And we're not going to spend any more time on these type of descriptive studies because what we want to do is focus on the more uh, analytic studies, those that test hypotheses, the cohort study and the case control study. So this diagram shows you a schemata of how a cohort study would be designed. You have your study population, all right, and basically you're not randomizing them to anything. You're watching them over time. Um, some people may be exposed to the risk factor and develop disease or not. And some people may not be exposed to the risk factor but develop disease or not. And what you're doing over time is, to, is watching and waiting, looking at who developed the disease, um, whether they were exposed or not. And this is important when we get to the statistical interpretation of the data for cohort studies. So here's the schemata. We're assuming that the people in this cohort don't have the disease that you're looking for uh, at the time of the study. They're well, they're healthy. We are assuming that they are disease free. But they can be classified for possible risk factors that could be related to the outcome. I mean, you have a hypothesis. You're hypothesizing that X risk factor or Y risk factor may contribute to the development of disease or diseases. And you're going to then classify people by either being exposed to the risk factor or not. You either live near a drilling rig or you don't. You either been exposed to the byproducts of uh, shale gas development, the chemicals and so forth, or you haven't. But there's no intervention. We're not doing anything to the group other than just watching and waiting over time. And then we will keep track of who develops diseases. Okay, we can calculate the incidence of disease, new cases, uh, over time. And most importantly, we need to make sure that a cohort study goes for a long enough period of time. In other words, if we're interested in cancer development, we know that cancer takes a long time to develop. So it's probably not the best idea to use a cohort study to look at cancer in populations, all right? We can short circuit the cohort study by going back in time, and this is called a historical cohort study. So we can collect data that's happened in the past among the cohort, the same group that we're following, and then follow forward. So there are actually two types of cohort studies. One will go forward automatically. You watch, you wait, disease develops, etc. Or you go back in time, and then you follow forward. Same group, getting the information, okay? But we need to make sure that we're following people for a sufficiently long period of time. And what we're doing is we're comparing, let's go back, we're comparing those who were exposed to those who were not exposed and then looking at the development of disease. And the way we do this is prospectively, as I said, and we then will use a statistic called the relative risk. It's the risk of disease in the exposed divided by the risk of disease in the non-exposed. And a relative risk, here's the formula, you have your typical two by two table with your cells A, B, C, and D, yes, outcome, yes, exposure, cell A, uh, yes, exposure, no outcome, B, no exposure but disease is C, and no exposure, no disease is D. And here is the formula as shown on the right of the screen. So you're going to look at the relative risk. And it's going to give you a number. It's going to be greater than one or less than one or around one. If it's greater than one, what it's telling you is that there is some sort of an elevated risk of disease among those who were exposed compared to those who were not exposed. 
So if it's 1.1, it's pretty much a wash. But if it's 1.9, if it's greater than 2, you're doubling the risk of disease because of exposure to the risk factor, that's telling you something. If it's less than 1, there's some sort of protective effect going on. So that's important too. Just because it's less than 1 doesn't mean that it's bad. There's a protective effect going on. And if it's around 1, maybe the study wasn't sufficiently powered. Maybe the study population wasn't the most appropriate. Maybe the study didn't go on long enough. And maybe, 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 but all you can say is that there's no association between risk factor and disease if your relative risk is about 1. So with the cohort studies, they're good because we can look at the incidence of disease over time. We can analyze predictor risk factors. We can measure events in a temporal way, trying to distinguish cause from effect. But there are buts. Um, you have problems with loss to follow up. What, you know, you're following people over time. They may, you know, leave the neighborhood. They may refuse to, you know, uh, you may lose them. They're lost. You don't know where they are. And there may be other factors that are contributing to the disease that you didn't think about. Confounding factors. In other words, if you didn't ask about smoking history, you know, we know smoking is associated with so many chronic diseases. Maybe it's not what you were thinking of that caused the disease, but maybe it's, it's smoking. So we're looking at rates of progression, staging the natural history of disease over time. And basically, we can study multiple potential effects of a given exposure. They're very good studies. They're, do they're done well. They're expensive. They take a long time. But they shouldn't be dismissed uh, uh, as something that, you know, is not good. They're good. But they're inefficient for the study of rare conditions. You wouldn't use a cohort study for that. Uh, as I said, they're expensive and time-consuming. We have problems with loss to follow-up that could indeed compromise the results. And you need a large number of people because you're following them over time. Probably the most famous cohort study is the Framingham study, you know, that was done in Framingham, Massachusetts. Uh, this has been going on for decades. We've got a wealth of information about many, many diseases and risk factors. And basically, um, uh, cohort studies can provide that information, assuming that you have somebody who's willing to fund them. Let's move now to case control studies. And these are different. If you remember the schemata for the cohort study, it sort of looked the same, but look closely, it's different. Here we have a study population, and the study population is specifically selected. You're selecting your cases. These are the people that have the disease that you're looking at. So they are known to have the disease, they meet your criteria for inclusion in the study, and then what you're doing is you're comparing the cases to the controls. And the controls obviously have to be similar to the cases in many, different, many respects. And your outcomes, what you're looking at is now retrospectively, who was exposed to the risk factor and who wasn't. So among your cases, who had the exposure and who didn't. Don't forget, they all have the disease. I mean, some people who had no exposure still got the disease. And same thing with the controls who had the exposure and who didn't, okay? So, and these people don't have the disease. So there's a very nice comparative setup that we're going to be looking at in order to assess, assess um, uh, strength of association between a risk factor and a disease. Case control studies, they're more difficult to do in many respects, but they are useful for studying infrequent events and diseases that take a long time to develop. You would never do a cohort study on a rare disease or a disease that takes a long time to develop, but you can with a case control study. You cannot calculate the relative risk, relative risk is, is based on incidence, but you can calculate the odds ratio which approximates the uh, relative risk. And I'll show you the formula in a few seconds. Here we're looking at the relative importance of a predictor variable in relation to the presence or absence of disease. We know who's sick. In a cohort study, we don't. But in a case control study, we do. 
And you don't need as many people in these uh, types of studies. But you do need to compare. Just as you're comparing exposed and not exposed in the cohort study, you're comparing the cases with the controls in the case control study. Of course, it's extraordinarily important to define who is a case. What is the criteria? And then who's a control? What's that criteria? And you have to make sure that you're selecting controls so that they would have had been identified and included as a case had they had the disease. They have to be similar to the cases in so many respects, otherwise you're going to be comparing apples with oranges. And of course the controls and the cases have to meet the same criteria for inclusion into the study. The validity of a case control study depends above all on the comparability of the cases and the controls. Okay, so you need them from the same population base. It could be a hospital control, it could be a, f a family member control, it could be a neighbor who's the control, but basically they should have an equal opportunity of being exposed to the risk factor that you are hypothesizing is causing the disease. So how do we do this? We do it by something called matching, okay? And we usually match on age and sex, so that the case is similar in age and sex to the control, okay? You don't want to pick a slew of variables that you're going to match on, because then you're not going to be able to evaluate that as a risk factor. So a couple of key variables, age, sex generally, uh, are used when matching cases to controls. And the study is done, again, retrospectively, so everything has happened in the past. You're collecting your data, could be based on hospital records, could be based on interviews, et cetera, uh, survey information, and then you analyze it. And the statistic that one uses for a case control study is the odds ratio, okay? So we're looking here at the risk of disease um, with the formula A times D divided by B times C. Refresh your memory, go back to the two by two table that I presented for the relative risk and you'll see where A, B, C, D cells are on the two by two table. Okay, in a case control study, the risk of disease cannot be directly calculated because the population at risk is not known. You already know who's sick. So, we're using the odds ratio here and you're going to get a number. It's going to be greater than one, it's going to be less than one, or it's going to be around one. And the same um, um, principles hold for the odds ratio interpretation as it does for the relative risk. Anything above one indicates that there's some sort of an association between the risk factor and the disease. Anything less than one indicates that there's some sort of protective effect. And anything around one is a wash. We're not quite sure what's going on. From the study findings, we cannot say that risk factor A is causally associated or uh, the strength of association is greater uh, in, uh, you know. We need to see something greater than 1.5 at least. So, case control studies are good, they're hard to do, um, but certainly they're cheaper and easier to, do, uh, to a certain extent to do than the uh, cohort studies. You don't need so many people in these kind of studies. But many case control studies are, are um, methodolog methodologically flawed because the controls are not well suited uh, to be compared to the cases. You're also relying on recall information, past exposure. If you're sick, believe me, you're going to remember or try to remember everything that probably contributed to your illness. If you're not sick, you probably don't, you know, think of these kind of things. And the validation of information can be difficult or impossible. The information may not be available. So again, so these kind of factors can lead to problems in case control studies. And it may be hard to, do, to determine a temporal relationship in case control studies. Bias is a big factor in any study but certainly in a case control study. Uh, we talked about selection bias in a cohort study. Maybe the cohort's not generalizable or representative of the people with the disease or the people in the population. 
Same thing with the case control study. Maybe the cases are not really representative of those with the disease. Issue of recall bias I talked about. And this can distort findings. And we talked about matching. In addition to recall bias and selection bias, there's non-response bias. They're not giving you answers to the questions. Uh, information may be misclassified. Um, and all of this could help, in a sense, um, make the case control study findings a little less uh, effective, strong, uh, compared to other types of studies. Now, I've mentioned confounding. Uh, we talked a lot about bias, which is error. That's something the researcher failed to correct in their study. And it contributes to sort of a, you know, a, a lessening of the study findings. With confounding, we're looking at a situation where there's a third factor that's both a risk factor for the disease as well as being associated with the exposure, and that could affect the findings. Age and sex, for example, are typical confounders if you're not taking them into account. So this diagram, in a sense, hopefully describes what I'm talking about. Um, with the uh, causal pathway, coffee drinking leading to pancreatic cancer. Study is done. They find that people who drink more coffee are at greater risk of developing pancreatic cancer. And uh, the researchers so conclude. But it may well be that they fail to take into account a third factor, one that is associated with the risk factor and the disease. And in this case, I'm suggesting that smoking is a confounding factor. The causal pathway may not be so straight. The pancreatic cancer may not be directly linked to coffee drinking. It may be coffee drinking and smoking. So we need to take into account possible confounding factors that could perhaps distort a true association. So in summary, let's take a look at cohort versus case control studies. You would do a cohort study when uh, you can easily identify a group, a population, and you have access to them. You're not looking at uh, a rare disease, the exposure is going to be rare, and there may be multiple diseases. You can certainly test that in a cohort study. You're looking at exposed people versus unexposed people, and you have to be very careful as to what defines being exposed and what defines being not exposed. With the case control study, you have identified people with the disease, okay? You, you're going back in time, it's retrospective, um, and you're comparing those with the disease to those without the disease, okay? You don't have the time or the money to do a cohort, and so you're going to just select those with the disease and those without. So the cohort and the case control studies are, are valid, they're good, they're helpful, they have their strengths, they have their weaknesses, um, but again, they're not what we would consider the gold standard because there's sort of bias inherent in this. Uh, in a cohort study, people may select to be in the study, they may elect to be in the study, and they may be different from those who don't want to be in the study. Cases in the case control study may not for some reason be representative of everybody with that disease. So again, we have to read the study carefully and assess in our own minds whether we accept the findings or not, um, taking into account potential uh, methodological uh, errors, flaws, weaknesses. But with the randomized clinical trial, here we're looking at, we have control. We're taking a population, we're randomizing them to one group, to another group. Now, to a certain extent, we cannot do this with shale gas development. We can't randomize people to go live near a, 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 a rig and people not to. So for the studies that we want to see for shale gas development, we need to go back to the cohort and the case control studies, even the descriptive studies. But you're not going to be able to do a randomized clinical trial because that would be unethical and impossible to do. That being said, we're going to go through the study design and, and look at the pros and the cons, the strengths and the uh, weaknesses of this. Most of the literature that you're reading in the journals are based on clinical trials. 
uh, and for those types of studies, looking at differences in a particular drug or diff different uh, treatment uh, compared to standard treatment, randomized clinical trials are the way to go. Case control studies and cohort studies would be less strong. You would go with the clinical trial. So we need a comparison here too though. We're looking at those who were randomized to one group compared to those who were randomized to another group. Comparison is key. You need to know what the endpoints are. Usually there's one primary endpoint, maybe a secondary endpoint. And these are defined before the study is even, you know, initiated. You have your hypothesis for all these studies. You have your hypothesis and you have your ideas about who's going to be in your study and not, your inclusion and ex exclusion criteria, and basically everything has to be quantifiable, measurable. Endpoints are used to determine sample size. And again, particularly in randomized clinical trials, sample size is important. So to determine the number of subjects needed for sufficient power, statistical power, it's important that the reference population from which the study sample is drawn is representative of those in the population and is clearly defined. And there are many different ways to calculate uh, power. You can do this uh, using canned uh, power calculation uh, formulas online and so forth. But basically, it depends on the magnitude of the difference to de be detected, and this is what the researchers hypothesizing. They're looking for a 5% uh, effect, a 10% effect. It's related to the risk of a type 1 error, which means concluding that treatment is effective when it's not. It's a type 1 error. And certainly the larger the sample, the greater the likelihood of sufficient statistical power. So we do need to take into account how many people are in each of these studies that you're reviewing, because it does make a difference. The concept of intention to treat is uh, important r in randomized clinical trials. Here, and you'll see, usually in the methodology section of a, of a published study, that this was a double-blinded, placebo-controlled, randomized clinical trial using intention to treat analysis. Here, we're analyzing the data as if the individual had remained in his or her original group so that the outcomes are ascribed to the originally assigned group. What this means is that once a person is analyzed to a group, that's where the data get analyzed. Okay? Even if they drop out and they can't switch, you know, there's no switching in a trial. The data that have been collected for the people, whether they completed the trial or not, are analyzed to the group to which they were analyzed. And that's the whole concept of intention to treat. Certainly we want to look at statistical testing uh, to assess uh, statistical signifi significance. Usually alpha is set at 0.05 by convention, that's your p-level. Um, that a p-value below 0.05 is considered to be statistically significant. You've seen that in the literature. Something um, in the literature where you see a p-value of less than uh, 0 0.001, that's highly statistically significant. But you need to be mindful of a false positive conclusion. And that's, as I mentioned before, a type 1 or alpha error. And there we're saying the probability that there is a difference in treatment effects when there really is not one. Type 1 error. So we take that into account. Beta is usually set at uh, 0 0.80 or 20%. And we need to take into account a type 2 error, or beta error. And here, the probability of saying that there is no difference in treatment effects when there is one is called a type 2 or beta error. And you'll see this in the literature. Something that also has to be included in all, in all of these statistics, particularly with the relative risk and the odds ratio, is the 95% confidence interval. You'll see the relative risk given. Relative risk equals uh, 1.3, and then they'll have in brackets a lower number and an upper number, the confidence intervals. So what you're saying here is there's a 95 chance that the interval between the upper and the lower limits around the point estimate 
includes the true effect size. And this is very, very important to take a look at. It's going to tell you two things. One, whether the findings are statistically significant, and two, whether the, um, the, the study was sufficiently powered. The more narrow the confidence interval, the more certain one can be about the size of true effect. So let me give you a little diagram. Uh, I'm going to give you a diagram in a minute. But here, what we're saying is that you need to see, you should demand to see the confidence interval uh, when a relative risk and an odds ratio is presented. And you can immediately see if the results are statistically significant or not. If zero is included in the upper and lower interval, okay, the interval for a mean, the results are non-significant. For a relative risk and an odds ratio, if the confidence interval includes one, the results are non-significant. So you don't even need a p-value, you don't need anything. If one is included, you know it's not significant. If it doesn't include one, it is significant. Okay, and again, you can see if it's sufficiently powered or not. So take a look at this diagram. Um, here you have a relative risk. You have one, and then it goes up, and then below. So as I mentioned, relative risk is greater than one or less than one. Let's say a relative risk of two is shown on this uh, slide on the left side. P-value is calculated at 0.05. It's not statistically significant. You know this from the P-value, but you also know it looking at the blue line, which shows the upper and lower limit, and it crosses one. So it's not significant. You could eyeball it, immediately tell that. Here in the middle, you have a relative risk of two. Your p-value is 0.05. But it's just one. It's just barely statistically significant. Okay? It didn't cross one, but it's sort of at one. But take a look at the one on the right. Here, same thing. Relative risk is two. P-value is uh, less than 0.05, you know that's statistically significant, but you also know it's statistically significant just by looking at the upper and lower band around the relative risk, and it does not cross one. So you know immediately that there is statistical significance. So it's a handy statistic, it tells you a lot of information, and it's important that studies include it. Okay? You have to be mindful. Statistical significance is not the same as clinical significance. You could have something that's statistically significant, a blood pressure study, and they found that with drug X, uh, blood pressure decreased and it was statistically significant and the researchers were very happy. But you as a physician taking a look at the drop in systolic and diastolic pressure would say, so what? It, it really didn't drop very much. It may be statistically significant, but clinically significant, it's not. Um, doesn't mean very much, okay? Also, if you have enough, in quotes, people in your study, the more the merrier, you probably will find a statistically significant result, okay? So these huge studies generally will find statistical significance. So in review, let's just review again. Factors that can compromise a study. These are the factors that you want to look at to determine whether you should place your trust in the findings. If the methodology, the study plan is vague, that's not going to be very helpful. The methodology should be very clearly delineated by the researchers so that you know what it is that they're doing, what they're testing, and how they're going to go about doing it. And the methodology should be, um, you know, extensive rather than skimping. What about the study population? Is the study population appropriate? So if we're looking at something, uh, you know, dealing with shale gas development, clearly you want to look at people who are living in close proximity to the drilling rigs, but you need a comparison group. So you want to find a group that is not near the drilling, grid, uh, drilling rigs. You want to look at counties with drilling compared to counties without drilling and what do the findings show. We need to make sure that we understand who's in the study, what are their characteristics, basically what's the inclusion criteria, what's the exclusion criteria. Is the study design appropriate to answer the questions that are being asked? 
Again, we cannot do a randomized clinical trial uh, in these kind of uh, uh, studies looking at shale gas development, but we could do a cohort study, we could do a case control study, we could also do a descriptive study. With descriptive studies, uh, we can compare um, uh, data that are collected by the government, diseases uh, and so forth, in counties with drilling and counties without. In a cohort study, you could take a nice group that's, that's living in a county with drilling and then following them over time, looking at those who were exposed compared to those who were not exposed, who lived near the drill, drilling rig, who didn't, and so forth. And in a case control study, the same thing. Duration of study is important. It has to be sufficiently long to reach an outcome, an endpoint. And the study should be sufficiently powered. Too few study subjects are not going to help advance uh, the body of knowledge. How were the participants handled who were, you know, those who were lost to follow up? Did, you know, did, how did they differ from those who stayed in the study? So whatever information you have on those who were lost to follow up, you want to compare to those who stayed in the study. And hopefully they didn't differ too much so that uh, you know, you're not dealing with two disparate groups. Those who left the study you know, were quite different from those who stayed in the study and what would have the results been had they stayed in the study. Uh, bias, how was bias handled? What types of bias would you expect to see in this study that was done and how did the researchers account for it? Ditto for confounding. Did they use the, the correct statistical test? Certainly with a cohort study, you should see a relative risk. Certainly in a uh, uh, case control study, you should see an odds ratio. And then there are all sorts of other statistical tests that could be used to further analyze the data, analysis of variance and so forth. But it depends on, on uh, uh, the number of variables that were selected, et cetera, et cetera. Survival analysis, if, if you're looking to see who reached an endpoint and outcome. Uh, you, you could look at all sorts of different studies, uh, statistics as well. And then do you believe that the study's valid? Okay. Did the data measure what it was intended to measure? And even if the study is designed perfectly and beautifully, sometimes, sometimes things don't work out as planned. The key is to make sure that you've looked at the study design, that you've looked at the methodology, that the statistics were appropriate and, and collected well, that there weren't too many people who were lost to follow up, and that the findings make sense. And then compare it to other studies so that we could get a, a, a picture of what's going on. So this can apply to shale gas development, it can apply to any other uh, study that you're reading based on any other disease that you're interested in, but all of this should be taken into account so as to ensure that you're using the best evidence, the best study, I should say the best evidence from the best study, in order to draw a conclusion. Thanks very much.